Welcome to the Low Post Podcast on a Friday morning. The second round of the playoffs is underway and the biggest, most anticipated series is now tied at 1-1. The Golden State Warriors make some adjustments, go a little smaller, overcome an illness to Kevon Looney, and blow out the Los Angeles Lakers, continuing a rather anticlimactic streak of home teams who lose game one, obviously home favorites who lose game one, coming back and winning game two. I believe that is the 16th straight such game to win for a home team down 1-0. Um, but we are 1-1, and that series will resume on Saturday, we get Sixers Celtics 1 1 after a boring game two blowout where James Harden came back to earth and Joel Embiid didn't solve all the problems. And Nuggets Suns is also tonight. That's the only 2 0 series. Heat Knicks, bloodbath, slugfest, old school, slow paced, bully ball. That resumes on Saturday. We'll talk about that. Bobby Marks, how are you? How's it going? Going good. Ready to go. Big weekend. Big weekend of NBA. Big weekend of NBA. I got to tell you, Bobby, last night, only one game, 9 p.m. tip-off, which, because it was on the glorious family of ESPN networks, really means like 9.17, and everyone's like, where's the game? Can we just start the goddamn game? It's 9.17. Apologies to ESPN overlords. It's just a thing. It's annoying. Um, And I'm sitting there, and even though I'm not at the game, like I normally would be for a finals game. Like I had the, I had the butterflies in my stomach of a finals game because of the late tip off, because it was the only game on. And just because you, you do have these moments where you sit back and you, you look at Steph Curry and LeBron James and Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Anthony Davis, maybe to a lesser extent, and you're like, man, these guys are still at it. Like, I, I've lived, these guys have been main characters in my life for a long time now at the absolute highest levels of the game. And you look back at some of the old clips of, you know, Dave McMenamin had that great essay we've been running, video essay, um, of like the 15, 16 finals between Cleveland and Golden State. And Curry just looks so young. And, everybody looks so much younger and, and here they are. And these just sort of megawatt names. And it's just, God, I got the butterflies going on my stomach and I had to remind myself, Oh, it's, it's a second round game. It's not an NBA. Fun. I have like, uh, I, I'm on a group text with some neighbor friends and none of them are real NBA fans. One of them just texted the group yesterday morning being like, did you guys know trivia fact? Did you guys know? And, and she said, Zach probably knows, but did you guys know? Steph Curry and LeBron James were born in the same in the same hospital in Akron, Ohio. Like everyone is dialed. Like people who don't follow the NBA are aware this series is going on, and it's now one one, and uh, and all the Golden State adjustments to open up the floor seem to work. Anthony Davis, after laying waste to the Warriors in Game One, uh, had a quiet Game Two. And uh, now we go back to Los Angeles. What did you see, Mr. Marks, before I go crazy about what I saw? You know, it's funny. What I saw was something that J.J. Redick said like a month ago. And I think this was even before the playoffs started when he looked at looking at kind of the Warriors offseason as far as what needs to be addressed. And this is kind of jumping once the playoffs are, are, are over. And he said, you know, basically Draymond and Looney together basically hogs everything up, right? They didn't really have a space, you know, uh, a stretch four or a stretch or a big like Brooke Lopez that can shoot threes, stretch the floor. And what you saw last night is you put Draymond at the five and you put Jamichael Green at the four. And it just kind of it just opened it just opened things up, you know, for a guy that I mean, let's face it, really didn't play that much. She didn't play at all, really, in the Sacramento series and came out and had 15 points. Um but the reality is, I mean, this was a this was a, a Laker team that was up. What were they up eight at in the second quarter before Golden State went on that run? And um, you know, I know certainly Golden State was up. You know, going into into the half here, I just thought the pace. I thought the 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 from like the eight minute mark of the second quarter on that Golden State just dictated the pace, right? Like just even when they got into the half court. I thought uh, Draymond did a really good job pushing AD away from the basket. Um, 
but man, the shot, the shot making, the shot making continually amazes me with Clay Thompson. Like those are not easy shots. Like what, you know, what he, what he made last night here. And um, I thought what they did was they limited Jordan Poole's minutes a little bit here. They kind of reined him back he was, in. He was awful last night. Yeah. Awful. Even awful. The, some five of the fouls, fouls he made. Yeah. Five fouls. Fouls. It was very fitting that the, um, the first Lakers free throws of the game were on Jordan Poole just standing up straight in a non-stance, which I guess is a stance, a non-stance stance. Dennis Schroeder's like, oh, you're just, just going to stand up flat foot all blow by you. And Jordan Poole reaches and fouls him. And that's why the Warriors have had foul issues all year is they can't contain dribble penetration. And it's one of the reasons I picked the Warriors in seven in this series is that the Lakers don't really have those like blow by super fast guards who can just just roast you off the dribble and like like the way Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox were able to do in the first round and I I thought Jordan Poole like he had a very good game one and last night he just was just bad it's yeah it's, I don't know it, why I felt the need to interject about no Jordan. because it felt like game one was like a litmus test right we're gonna let you go right we're going to do what you want to do here right I mean I think he had 21 in that game and and here it was like all right now we're gonna pull you back Right now we're going to maybe we're going to extend more minutes to Moses Moody. We're going to play Dante DiVincenzo a little bit more here. And both those guys got you. They got 18 points the two those two players here. And it it showed you that, you know, you know, you don't need a, you know, a 25 point game from Jordan Poole. And I think certainly defensively, there's concerns as far as him on the court here. I thought Wiggins was really good. I thought Wiggins like just little things with him like rebounding the ball loose balls like just like you didn't need to go out i mean he got you 11 points but just a little i mean it was i mean say what you want about plus minus who's a plus 35 in the game well right if you're gonna play small and you're gonna play draymond at the center a lot and you're gonna play a team with anthony davis sometimes with vanderbilt and hachimura or like three of the lebron hachimura davis vanderbilt quartets a big group you're going to have to gang rebound. Like everyone is going to have to contribute. And that's one like Curry's always been good at that. And I thought Wiggins was, was also tremendous. And I also still think they're leaving money on the table with Wiggins on offense. They cannot let D'Angelo Russell just sit there hiding on Andrew Wiggins. Like give me four Andrew Wiggins post-ups because you're going to have to send a double team. Give me a a Curry Wiggins pick and roll to try and hunt D'Angelo Russell and just let Curry cook. Like, I think there's a little, bits of Wiggins money that the Warriors uh, I mean who had an amazing game plan for game two I still think they're leaving a little money on the table yeah I, I agree I mean I and I and I thought from from the Lakers perspective I thought there was a big missed opportunity in that second quarter there when they were up I mean they came down I think there was two um, Austin Reeves three in the corner that he was short on um, there was another I don't know who there was another three on the top of the key like they went for the kill like they went for the kill shot, like in the middle, in the beginning of the, of the second quarter. And I thought, you know, Hey, you know, post up AD man, get him, get him something easy around the basket or expand the lead. And I just thought they, you know, they, it was almost like a little bit of fool's gold there here. And that kind of, you know, long, you know, missed three long rebound golden state gets out and transition gets out and runs um, either layups or, you know, or open threes. They were flying last night. To the point that I, all, I I often thought they were like reckless in their in their desire to just hit the accelerator at all times, which I think is smart because another reason I picked the Warriors in seven in this series was I'm just not sure that LeBron and AD are going to be able to hold up under the minutes burden that they're going to have to play, yeah. under the scoring burden that they're going to have to carry, under the defensive burden that Davis is under, and I'm going to talk about that later. This is... This is an all-encompassing assignment defensively for him. He has to literally be almost in two places at once over and over and over again on every single possession. And that, and by that, I mean if he's guarding Draymond or Looney, on a lot of possessions he's going to start, <clears throat> even when Draymond's at center, he's going to start in the paint because Draymond's going to have the ball and there's going to be the split action and the cutters and his first job is going to be if there's a cut, I got to be in the paint. If there's dribble penetration, I got to bet on my guards to get over the screen and get in the paint. But then, shoosh, I got to zoom up 
to the point of attack. If suddenly Clay's taking a dribble handoff or Steph's running a pick and roll, he and he was in the first half. I thought I call that the Golden State yo-yo. I got to ride the yo-yo back and forth. I got to ride the yo-yo. I thought he was <clears throat> tremendous in the first half. In the second half, I thought you could start to see him wilt a little bit. Like he was a little bit late going on the upside of that yo-yo on a couple of those clay threes in the third quarter. There was too much space to open. And you know what? Anybody would wilt a little bit under the pressure that he's got to do that possession after possession after the after possession as the keystone of their defense. Um and so that's why I think the Warriors are smart to run, even if it gets a little bit reckless. Well, I think, too, like, even though they lost game one, I mean, I think they kind of set the tone a little bit of how they're going to play when they got down. I guess it was one, 112-98, right, in that, at the end there. And they went on, like, they went small, put Draymond at the five, and they went all guards. And that, I mean, that was like, I said that, uh, I was talking about Wendy, I was like, man, it was like the Indy 500. Man, pool party, baby. Like, they threw the pool party lineup, a lineup I mean, that, that Steve – has lost faith in, yeah. you know, round by round in the playoffs last year, that lineup, which we all celebrated in the middle of, what should we call it? How about pool party? How about yeah. splash party? How about whatever? How about death lineup 4.9.2? And as the opponents got bigger and better, that lineup played less and less. And it was, I think it was the third most played lineup in the regular season, but that only ended up at like 150 minutes. And and even last night, it played, I think, a few minutes, but not much. But but he busted it out at the end of yeah. that game, and it was like, oh my god, they are playing fast. And what he, and what you did was you just tweaked it. You know, you basically said we still need some size, right? So we're gonna, you know, Pool's going to be basically kind of the odd man out. We're going to put Michael Green in with Draymond, and we're going to leave, you know, there, our other three starters here. And that's kind of how we're going to. We're still going to play fast, but we still have a, you know, a big body there that can, you know, that can defend and, and grab rebounds. Here's my concern for the Lakers. For this series through two games, they are now averaging. It's only two games, I realize. And garbage time was the entirety of the fourth quarter last night. But they're averaging 107 points per 100 possessions. That would have ranked last in the regular season. For the entirety of the playoffs, which again is only eight games for them, so not a huge sample, but this was not a good offensive team in the regular season for the most part, even after the trade deadline. They're averaging 109 points per 100 possessions. That would have ranked 29th in the regular season. The Lakers are in danger of becoming a one-way team. And as great as their defense is, and it's great. I mean, it is it it is it is somewhat it, it is very dependent on Anthony Davis, but it is great. And Vanderbilt has been tremendous chasing Steph Curry around and being a pain in the butt and being big. LeBron is still is still respected as a threat. He knows where to be. I thought last night though, there were a couple of times where he just did not rotate to the rim. He was on Jermichael Green and one was a Draymond dunk, and I can't remember off the top of my head what the other one was, but I, I rewatched it. I was like, well, that's that's LeBron's rotation. And he was like, yeah, no, I'm not going not gonna to do that. But I just don't think they can win this series, and they have loftier goals than that, as a, as a one-way team. And part of the reason that they're struggling on offense is there's and, – and part of the reason Anthony Davis struggled last night is there's just no room – for him to get below and even to the dotted line. If you watch, I rewatched all the Anthony Davis pick and rolls where he was a screener this morning. First of all, Draymond on Anthony Davis changed the, the total feel of that game. He's just so ferocious. AD tried him in the post once in the second half and Draymond was having absolutely none of it. And on the pick and roll, he's dropping back and he plays the angle so well, he's never going to let AD get behind him ever. They're going to have to make a D's going to have to make floaters and 18 footers. He's not getting dunks and rim runs and he's not getting dunks and rim runs because they're just not going to guard anybody else. They're not going to guard Vanderbilt, obviously. And so you say, okay, do they're going to have to take Vanderbilt off the floor to open up their spacing? Well, the trickle down effect of that is number one, you lose the guy you want defending Curry even more than Schroeder, who's been fine and you lose size and you lose rebounding. But even when they take him off the floor, they're not guarding Hachimura and credit Hachimura. He's making him pay for it. They're not guarding Schroeder. You watch some of these pick and rolls. Steph Curry is in the middle of the paint, not the edge of the paint. 
the middle of the paint, clogging it up with Schroeder in the corner. And they're not guarding LeBron at all. There was one pick and roll I, I rewatched. It was in the first quarter where Clay was on LeBron. And it was a D low Anthony Davis pick and roll. And LeBron was at the top of the top of the arc. Very top. And normally you would say, okay, Clay will be at the nail. Like that would that would that would be dramatic help if he's in the middle of the foul line. Clay was like in the restricted area. It was so disrespectful. They're not guarding anybody on the team. And I don't really know what the solution to that is other than those guys are going to have to make shots. And zooming out to the idea that the Lakers are a one-way team, their offensive rating with LeBron on versus LeBron off for the entire playoffs is, is like about the same. It's no better. It's actually like a, a minuscule hair worse with LeBron on the floor. And after last night's minus 27 for the playoffs, they are minus three with LeBron on the floor and plus 26 with LeBron off the floor. And he just has not been consistently able to assert his will in either of these series. And I wrote it going into game two. It just feels like this is the official transition to Anthony Davis is the number one guy on the team. And that's fine. LeBron's 38 years old. But this is, this is the first time I can remember where the whole, like, is LeBron's game going to slip a little bit with age? I, I feel like I'm kind of watching it right now because even last night when he played bully ball, like he had a post up over Clay and a post up over Wiggins. It was when they were down 14 and 16 and it was kind of like all right i've had enough of this nonsense give me the ball i'm gonna post up and he just hasn't been able to do that consistently we just haven't seen a lot of like the lebron call up curry's man to set a screen call up pool's man to set a screen and when we have seen it and he's tried to engage that part of his game the spacing hurts him too because he starts driving in the lane there's four guys there and i just they're a one-way team right now, and they can't win this series as a one-way team. We can talk about some of their ways out of being a one-way team, but one of them is, and he made a lot of jump shots last night. Like He wasn't the reason they lost, but he, I think we're just going to need to see him try to dip into whatever that kind of physicality bully ball he has left in him because the Warriors are going to clog everything else up, and the Lakers just haven't been a good offensive team for, for a while now. Well, yeah, I mean, eight. Um, what did it? Eighteen attempts last night. Eight were threes, right? Um, only ten on twos. I think that you know, with, with, as you as you said and here. By the way, I, by the way, I should. I, sorry to interrupt you. I should acknowledge he he had a foot injury so serious that everybody sure. but the LeBron of feet told him to get surgery, and I I would be shocked if that were not impacting him to some degree right now. And it's admirable that he's playing through it. If if there's an it, I don't know. No oh, one's sure. asking about his foot anymore, but I assume it's something. I would, yeah, I would, I would think, I mean, I think, I mean, as you said, like kind of a one-way team, I think as you watch this team play, like there has to be close separation in these games, right? Like there can't, like, it feels like we saw it a little bit in that Memphis series in game five, like letting go of the rope, right? Like when, like when you're down, when they're down 10 or 12, like, it's almost like it's, it's like 20, right? It's, it's like, it, because of how they, you know, Hey, they're not, they're not Golden State where they're going to shoot a ton of threes and get get back in it. Basically, you're going to you know, you're going to get everything around the paint. You're going to get everything at the free throw line here. And I think the Lakers kind of go away from that a little bit. As I said, kind of looking for the home run. They went 10 for 34 from three last night, right? And kind of got away from how they played in um in in game one here. And I think for game three, they're going to have to set the tone, right? Like you know, as far as going back to that style that you know, got them up 12 in game one, right? Everything basically kind of, you know, put a barrier around the rim as far as for, you know, penetration for, for, for Golden State. Um, you know, everything for, for Los Angeles in the paint at the line here. And, um, but that's kind of like last night felt a lot like that game five loss to Memphis, right? Where it was just like, you know what? We got down 12, we, we got our game you know, we got our game already and we just kind of let go of the rope a little bit. Well, 
Yes. I mean, they didn't, they stole the game. They got the first game. That's the game they needed. They got it. They have home court advantage. I think this is going to be a long series. Like I think the Warriors will probably split in LA and come back to San Francisco 2-2, but who knows? Um, but I do think that game and even the end of the first game have raised some issues about their offense and their spacing and conversely their ability to deal with the small, fast warriors. And that was the obvious adjustment. That was the adjustment everyone was calling for was if Anthony Davis is going to lay back in the paint, that's all he's going to do. Don't let him do it. And the way you don't let him do it is give him no choice, but to guard Draymond green. Right. So even in, even in when they had both the greens on the floor, LeBron was on Jermichael green and AD was on Draymond green. And when they go smaller than that, there was no Gary Payton. The second, like if you want to stash AD over there, maybe you could another non-shooter. He didn't play essentially till garbage done, not essentially didn't play till garbage done. And then have Draymond set screens for Steph Curry. Cause then you got to come up. And if you're up, then we can play four on three behind the plate like we've been doing for 10 years. And I don't know that there's a good answer. Like like the pocket pass from Steph to Draymond, AD was up high, as high as he should have been. He wasn't blitzing. He wasn't trapping. I don't know that a hard blitz is really the answer. He was kind of in a high drop, high enough that Steph couldn't just pull up for three, which is job one. But the pocket pass is there. And I don't really know that there's a way to take that pocket pass away. Steph can throw it blindfolded. He probably would be tempted to throw it blindfolded the way they sometimes play. Um, and Draymond knows all the reads from there. And, you know, it just reminds you how one of a kind Draymond Green is. Like, there's been all this, you know, we got to find this Draymond Green. And all that guy has to do is play four on three like Draymond Green. They're just – his – you just watch DeAndre Ayton get the ball when they blitz Durant. And it's like, okay, I got it. Pause, think, where. And it's not like he's pretty good at it. And with drama, it's like, bam, boom, turbo, hit the gas. You either confront me at the rim or I'm dunking. Or it's kick, kick, kick. And they ran uh, 22 pick and rolls in game one for Steph. Only 23 last night. So it wasn't like a sea change. I actually think they made the second spectrum maybe undercounting a little bit, but considering he didn't play the fourth quarter, it was actually 37 per 100 possessions versus 27 per 100 possessions in game one. Their points per possession were super, super high. And there's just never been a great answer to Draymond roaring through open space in a four on three and, and, Credit Steph for making the right pass. He had a bunch of assists last night. And, you know, the Lakers are gonna are gonna have to figure out, you know, is is what is our answer to that? And, you know, they can join all the other teams that have tried to find an answer for that since 2015. 38 assists last night. I mean, that's the that's the magic number. And I think if you said to me Curry's gonna have 20 points and, and Golden State's gonna win by 27, I would have told you you're nuts. You know, but as, as you said, like Golden State has something unique that other teams don't. They have a guy who's playing basically center, but it's basically playing point guard, center on defense, point guard on offense here. Um, I mean, even like the play at the end of the second quarter where the, the seas parted for Draymond down the middle here, like that was kind of like an indicator right there, you know. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think if you're Lakers, and I do agree that this is going to go this is going to go pretty, you know, six or seven games here um, that if you're the Lakers, you are a little bit of concerns and I'm, I'm interested to see what adjustments they make based off what you saw a little bit at the end of game one. And then basically what you saw up until, you know, things got a hand in, in the middle of that third quarter. I, I do think some of it, and Jeff Van Gundy said it during the broadcast and AD said it after the game. Some of it is like some days AD just makes these 13 foot floaters and some days he doesn't. And when he does, he scores 25 to 35 points. And when he doesn't, he might have a game like this. And, and the track record just in the last 10 games suggests he's just not going to score 30 a game. It's going to be a little bit more up and down than that. His, his mid ranger is just okay. And there are going to be some nights that it, that it doesn't work. Um, and like I said, I thought his defense early was really good. Like riding that yo-yo. There was one where he was back patrolling those split cuts and then Jordan Poole went around a screen and 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 I think it was Looney was handling the ball and AD like a freaking phantom jumped out got his hand up and Poole had an air ball that went out of bounds and you could tell it was like oh my god he got out there 
that fast, but that that's hard work. And Steph, Steph was tremendous just making the right play. And to me, the, the play of the game that shows that was like 820 left in the second quarter. It was a Steph Looney pick and roll. So Green Draymond was out. It was Looney as the only big man. And um Vanderbilt was on Steph. Got hit, got hit by the pick a little bit. So AD comes up. All right, job number one, done. I've come up. You can't shoot a three. Steph kind of crossed over a little bit to the middle of the floor and then stopped and 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 kind of kind of reared back like he might shoot, like a hesitation dribble. He's rising up. And that convinced AD, all right, it's safe for me now to retreat to Looney. And then Steph poof, put his head down, zoom, zoomed into the lane, made AD recommit deeper into the paint and then bounced it to Looney for a layup. And it's like, this guy is just manipulating yeah. everything. And it was a brilliant performance by him and a brilliant performance by the Warriors. And I think the the number one question the Lakers have to ask is how can we score more? And I don't know if you have any good answers for that, but you know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how do you score more? You gotta, you gotta take advantage of, you can't. And I, it's almost like going back to the, the Sacramento series. Like you can't have, multiple empty possessions like you can't to, to compete with this golden state team you can't have you know you know play good defense hold them to you know you know you know hold them to you know golden state to no points in, in a minute and then basically have two or three possessions where you're not you know you have to basically split the difference on every possession like that's kind of how you know, and I think it's, is it just making shots? You know, I mean, I mean, Austin Reeves had an off night. I mean, um, D'Angelo Russell had an off night. Is it, is that it? Is it just Schroeder was, you know, non, I think he was zero for three, I think last night. Um, Schroeder was here. Um, you know, I, I mean, certainly Colton State's defense was a lot better here, but no, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to kind of get in a mud, in a mud fight with these guys with, with the, with Golden State here. And that's basically how, you're going to have to try to slow it down and almost kind of get into a half court, you know, game. And I don't even know if that's good enough because as you saw, when they do slow it down and, and Draymond is basically, you know, orchestrating the offense, you're, you're getting, sometimes you're getting easy baskets um, or you're getting kind of wide open threes. I think they're going to have to, if they're, if the Warriors are not going to guard LeBron to the degree they're not guarding him, I think the Lakers might have to run a little bit more LeBron AD pick and roll and see if they can get some downhill traction with that with because the spacing will be better just because the, LeBron's handling the ball. That might require Vanderbilt playing fewer minutes, which is which is a a tough compromise to make. Um, but the Warriors don't want to switch those plays. Now they can, and they have switched Wiggins onto AD here and there, but they don't want to. So AD can maybe roll a little harder to the rim. They can get some traction with that play. I would like to see them try to get AD some post touches, like set some cross yeah. screens for him, get him some deep post touches. Like there are vehicles, the Lakers, I'd like to see AD even handle the ball now and then if he's up to it. I mean, there are vehicles they have. Give me some screen, the screener plays for LeBron. I don't know. They got to score more, but this is, um, this is a really, this is just a star studded, awesome series. I uh, Can I just uh, remark, go, go ahead. You want to say No, that? I mean, I think, that, and I, I think you hit it right in the head. I mean, I think what happens is that, you know, if, if you're not getting anything easy at the basket, you know, whether if you're posting up or you're spreading the floor where you're, what your shooters here, man, miss shots and you, they are off and running right? Like you're basically on your back heels on defense already, and you're not going to be able to set up kind of your, your defense. And I think we saw a lot of that in game two. I just want to make, make a remark on a very little thing that people will forget about. I am generally team save your challenge for the end of the game. Yeah. Never use your challenge early. Steve Kerr used this challenge on, the on charge. that Wiggins charge yeah. in the second quarter with about three minutes left. And the Warriors up 57 to 50. And I just took a little mental note of that because if you talk to a lot of the analytics people around the league that work inside teams, they're big, they, they actually push back some of them on the team save it for the end stance and say, like, I've had a couple of them tell me, how many points is it going to swing you? Right. And so that's, that's 
two free throws and and it ended up being three free throws because it was a technical on Phil yeah. Handy in the middle of that. Um, and some of them would say if there if you feel like it's a moment in a game where if you get two or three points out of it, it can kind of wrench control of the game towards your side. And I think if you ask Steve Kerr, I bet that's what he, I, I bet he would have thought, you know what, we're up seven. If we can get this to nine or 10, then we're one spurt away from getting it to 14. And maybe it just becomes a game we can control from ahead the whole time. And that's exactly what happened. And nobody will ever talk about that challenge being quote wasted in the second quarter because it worked and it was a blowout. I just bookmarked that because I think there is something to the idea that if you just feel this is a moment where we can seize the game. I, I, I do think there are times when, especially if it's a, a, a play where you're going to get basically automatic points out of it to, to use your challenge early. And I thought that was an interesting, an interesting move that made sense. Uh, more, I, and again, well, usually on team, just don't use it until the end. Well, especially that, I mean, it would have been a, you know, you went up, they went up 10 because of the two free throws and then the technical, I mean, you don't, you don't, you're all, you know, you come down, they come down and hit a two or a three. It's a four point game. Right. I mean, that's a big swing. I mean, I'd love to see, and I know we would be doing and probably would be, these games would be longer and stuff like that. I mean, I'd love for teams to get their, 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 um, their challenge back. If you win, you I, know, I, I know that, I'm anti, I'm anti are you? that. I just okay. I don't, even what about I don't the playoffs? Need, what about in the playoffs? No, I don't okay. need more. I don't need more. I okay. understand the logic behind it. Yeah. Like you shouldn't lose your time at whatever it is. Like I just don't, or you you shouldn't lose your challenge. I don't want any more delays in the game. Okay. Like let's let's just keep the thing moving. I don't want any more replays. I don't want any more delays. Um, any final Lakers Warriors thoughts? Oh, I it's gonna sound a little radical, Bobby. Oh boy. If the Lakers end up really needing shooting, there is a shooter who used to be in their rotation that is not in their rotation anymore because they don't trust him defensively. And I understand why they don't trust him defensively. I know. I know you're going. It might be time to give Malik Beasley a little bit yeah. of a cookie. Just give him a little cookie. Yeah. A little cookie of playing time. I, I'm just I understand why they don't trust him. He's a little bit of a wild card to be to be polite about it. But I've always been a Malik Beasley. If you if you need shooting, you got a shooter. It's it's the same player we talked about before the trade deadline, right? I mean, the guy that had been playing pretty well in Utah, and we thought that you know teams could maybe move a protected. What do you first think of the Schroeder? What do you think of the Schroeder Draymond knee thing? I mean, I don't. I didn't really make. I mean, I didn't make much into it. I mean, I was surprised that the broadcast did not bring up the Jordan Poole Ja Morant knee thing yeah which yeah. was very similar yeah from last year's playoffs and became like this raging controversy because Morant appeared to maybe have been injured although people thought maybe he was injured be on a yeah. play before that Taylor Jenkins made a big stink about it in yeah. the postgame media like yeah. let's see what the league does from here and nobody brought that up last night I thought that was interesting yeah it was, the War it was the Warriors again except it was reversed you know the Warriors were the victims of a knee grab and I thought that knee grab was actually like more obvious and and blatant like he kind of catapulted himself slingshotted himself i don't know I, I mean i didn't think it should have i wasn't like oh it's a flagrant blah 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 i yeah. was kind of like let's move on but anyway let's talk about nick's heat because we're geezers we got we're we're the nick's heat we're we're the proper we're the proper demographic for nick's heat cbs news at 6 p.m with Lester Holt, what what network is Lester? I'm just making. I don't know what hey, network. Hey, you could get, you could get, you could do the game tomorrow and still get the early bird special. You know, it's three thirty games on uh, on you, Saturday. You laugh at me, my friend. <laughs> Yesterday was my wife and my wedding anniversary. Our our, our and uh, five forty five dinner special, baby. There you go. There you go. I was hungry too. I was ready. <laughs> Nine p.m. game. I got all sorts of time. Let's get some apps. <laughs> some guacamole <laughs> the finance bros were there for happy hours like can we get these finance bros out of here they're crowding my they're crowding our seat get them out of here and by 6 30 p.m they were out of there but we're really infringing on the finance bros happy hour because we're sitting there for the early bird special at 5 45 right. that's, that's, unapologetic hey, that's, i don't that's, care that's, that's big down here in naples early bird special big oh, you're, you're down in here in naples nick's heat two uh one one 
I almost spoke two two into existence. Two 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 one one. Uh, just uh, just first of all, we've learned nothing really from the first two games of the series because Jimmy Butler missed game two and Julius Randle missed um, game one. So Jimmy Butler and Julius Randle played zero minutes together in this series. Um, the total score after two games is Miami plus one. The pace of the series is 92 possessions per game, which is so much slower than the slowest regular season team that it's just turning into this bruising uh, slugfest. The Heat, after winning game one um, with Jimmy Butler spraining his ankle and they limped toward the finish line and got the job done, Kyle Lowry made a bunch of big plays. They almost grand theft heated that game two game. It was almost grand theft Miami like, Okay, we're like running out of players. Bam picked up a foul five minutes of the game. Let's just play zone and shoot a lot of threes and see if we can walk out here with a win. And they damn near almost did it until the Knicks kind of sort of figured out how to play against the zone a little bit. Josh Hart made a couple of threes. Um, The Heat have given no updates concretely on Jimmy Butler. Based on what I know about Jimmy Butler, I'm expecting him to play tomorrow night, Saturday in game three. And if so, assuming Randall plays and Brunson plays, we will finally get to see what is left of these two teams. I mean, the Heat are already missing players. What are you looking for in game three? You know, it seems like every round there's a series where we get to game three and four. It's like, "Ah, it kind of feels like the series just started because of all these injuries, but it's starting now. Yeah, I mean, what I'm I'm interested to see is can the carry, I mean, I thought, you know, certainly the role players in my, you know, like, as you said, like game two was, I thought was there for the taking for Miami. Um, I, I'm interested. Can the, can this be a continual pattern of the role players in Miami, the Gabe Vincents, the Max Struces? Like, is this is, are are the, is this one offs? Right? Like, they were I mean, running their entire offense through Gabe Vincent in yeah. crunch time of game two. I'm sitting there, man. Like, Gabe Vincent, all the credit to you, man. Un, I believe undrafted. G League game yeah. two of the second round of the playoffs were like, hey man, you got to run the show for us. I, I'm interested to see how much of a leash do you have with Duncan Robinson because I felt like man when when he was on the court, Jalen Brunson's eyes lit up, you know, defensively like he was searching for him. Like you couldn't you couldn't hide Duncan Robinson defensively. Um, I'm interested in to see that. Um, yeah, I just like, I mean, even though Miami lost game two, like they just continually, continually amaze me as far as what they have out there, right? Like it just like as far as how much they're basically trying to squeeze out, out of this group, I would think it would be a major disappointment if New York doesn't win this series. I, I do. I mean, I just think kind of where the heat are right now. And um, I can't go there until I see how Butler looks because yeah. it, because if Butler is is healthy, they have by far the best sure. player in the series. Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly um that's certainly fair. I mean, I think um I'm interested to see like, you know, I didn't think quickly was good in game two. He hasn't um, been he hasn't been good essentially the entire yeah. playoffs. Yeah, I just thought there's like he's just been so reliant on the three ball and it's been some bad shots here. So like what do you get out of that out of the Knicks bench and how does 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 Tibbs even shorten his rotation even shorter, right? Where you're basically, you know, you know, playing that group, um, you know, 37, 38 minutes here. So, I mean, like, I mean, I think we're in for probably another, you know, a low, you know, probably a low scoring, you know, game here. Um, you know, game three is the, you know, the adjustment game, right? Like it's, you know, it's basically a best of five series right now. Except we haven't seen the real teams face off against each other. If the Heat had won that game too, they just should have run through the tunnel and like taken a getaway car to the airport and chartered a plane to get the hell out of it. That that's the degree to which that would have been just a total heist of, of a playoff game. Um, I'm going to start game three by looking at the big man matchups even more closely because with Randall back and Randall was pretty good. I thought in game two, um, the Heat kind of switch up the big man matchups. Bam guards Randall, which makes a whole lot of sense because if Julius Randall wants to go ISO against Bam out of bio, go ahead, big fella. It's not going to work out for you. And then Kevin Love has to guard Mitchell Robinson. And that's an area that I think both teams can peck at a little bit. 
So if I'm the Knicks, let me test Kevin Love's pick and roll defense a little bit. He wants to hedge that because they don't want him dropping back. Because if he's dropping back, he's just on an island and Jalen Brunson is going to go right through him. He wants to hedge. Okay, let me. Can I get something out of that? I'm, I'm. I don't really trust Mr. Robinson as like a playmaker in open space if he slips into open space. But can I make Kevin Love hedge two and three times and see what happens? And on the other side of the floor, if Mitchell Robinson ends up stuck on Kevin Love because they can't flip the matchups around, can I get something out of Kevin Love pick and pops? Maybe can I get can I can I get the Knicks in a little bit of un, uncomfortable rotations? And just the general big man thing, as bad as not as bad, the offenses have actually been okay in the series. It hasn't looked great. The Knicks again are beating the hell out of Miami on the offensive glass. They have rebounded thirty six percent of their own misses. It's been their best offense the entire playoffs. And at some point, some team is going to have to try to figure out how to keep Mitchell Robinson off the glass and keep these guys off the glass. Can, can, is Kevin Love one of the, you know, he's a great kind of root, root guys out rebounder, but he's not as athletic as he used to be. Is he up for that? Like, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start my focus on those matchups. And then we know that both of these teams, it's going to be a very simple, you know, just brute force series. The Knicks are going to try to hunt favorable matchups with Jalen Brunson and the heat are going to try to mat hunt favorable matchups with Jimmy Butler, whether that's trying to get switches in the pick and roll, whether that's calling some post-ups for Jimmy Butler. Um, and can, is Jimmy up to that? Is his ankle going to allow him to dominate the game that way? Who gives those matchups up? Who exploits them the best? It, it's going to be, it's going to be, if you like simplistic brutality, I think a lot of this series is going to be good for you. Yeah, I mean, game two, plus 16 rebounds, plus nine second chance points. Kind of like a little bit of the flavor from that Cleveland series, right? Like that's kind of was, that was kind of how they dominated the, you know, the, the the four wins. It was basically kind of like, like loose balls. Like I said this, um, I was talking to somebody the other night about it. I said, like, it felt like at the end of game two, like if you're using the hockey analogy, right? Like didn't it feel like New York was on a power play? Like it was basically went up, offensive rebound, kick out. Like Miami couldn't get the like the the puck out of the zone. Like, and that's that's kind of how New York is going to beat you. And then it turns into an open, you know, three by you know Josh Hart there, and that basically kind of you know gives them separation here. So that that is kind of if New York's going to win. That's kind of how you know they've they've shown it, right? They shown it in the Cleveland series. They showed it in um, they showed it in Game Two. Fell in love a little bit with the three ball in game a lot when in game one going seven for thirty four, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean that's I mean it's going to be a little bit of kind of bully ball as far as game three. The other thing that I think um, what Miami is doing that is smart is if the Knicks are hiding Brunson on Struess. Or Duncan Robinson, but among the starters, it's been Struess. They are running Brunson ragged on defense. Struess will run off of a million pin downs, cut here, cut there. And I think that's always really smart when the other team tries to hide their most important guard on a shooter, a movement shooter, amp up that guy's movement 25%. Yeah. Just have him moving around just for the sake of making Jalen Brunson run around a lot. Um and yeah, there's there's just a lot of interesting subplots sort of yet to be settled in the series. I don't think the zone is going to be a one-off gimmick for Miami. I think they liked what they saw. I know the Knicks got some shots on it or some good looks in the fourth quarter. I just, I didn't like their process against the zone for a lot of the game. I thought they just kind of mismatch hunted, which is fine. That's how they're built. But it did kind of remind you, like, this is not a great passing team. They don't have a lot of, like, flash to the middle, cut, boom, bam, over here. That's not how they play. And they don't play any zone on defense, so it's not like they, they're they super familiar in that sense. So um, it's going to be, hopefully, a fun series. Hopefully, Jimmy and Randall and, and Brunson are all feeling good and ready to go. And, yeah, man, Heat Knicks, like old times, four straight playoff series from 97 to 2000, brawls galore. I went down a... I went down a rabbit. I went down a Heat Knicks rabbit hole yesterday that ended with me watching the, I think, nineteen ninety three brawl between the Suns and the Knicks when Greg Anthony came off the bench wearing a hideous 
shirt and sucker punched or tried to sucker punch. It's unclear on the video. Kevin Johnson, when Kevin Johnson and Doc Rivers were fighting, and that was the reason the NBA implemented the rules about guys can't come off the bench. Yeah. And the reason that in four years later, all the Knicks end up getting suspended in two consecutive games after the PJ Brown, Charlie Ward wrestling. I just, I went down a, like a rabbit hole of fights. So in, in 2003, I got married and in August and Rod Thorne, um, who I worked for at the time and worked for a long time, you know, he was the head of, you know, he was the Dean of discipline, the right? Dean of discipline in the nineties. And he was the guy who levied the punishment for the brawl. You know, the, the, the char, um, the, um, was it Chris Charles, PJ Brown, right? The kind of, no, it was, it was Charlie Ward, PJ Charlie Brown. Ward, Charlie Ward into the stands here. And, so that was like what, like five or six years later, and I'm in. We're at the reception, and I look in the corner, and there are like my three buddies who are all Nick fans, and they got Rod in the corner, like basically having him walk through the punishment. Why the punishment? Why you know the staggered games? As far as you know, because there were so many guys that got suspended. Alphabetical was, order. They had to do it, it in alphabetical it order. It was one of the great. And I think I'm mean, thinking, oh my god, I'm at my wedding, and my my best friends are there, basically berating my a my boss, right? And be the guy. I'm sure. Who I'm, sure Rod, I'm sure he loved it. I'm oh, sure he did. He loved it. Oh, he he did. I mean, the stories that Rod used to tell me about the, those Knicks teams, basically, like you know, they used to come over his house. Um, back in in the night you know the oakley days and stuff like that because they would they in mace and they basically they they bitch and moan i mean back then they were so much of a a two-way street where like you know you had more of a dialogue right like you could call you could talk to rod and say you know like you guys are pick you're picking on me and he'd be like you know what come up to my house on saturday and we're gonna watch film together and they would go and he like those that group like that oakley mason group went up there i remember him telling me one morning saturday morning they watched film together on like all their antics on the court and why they were being you know basically not singled out but being penalized here and nowadays you're not doing that here but you know it's it's one of the you know one of the great stories that you know stood with me i was really hoping that story would be would be like anthony mason and charles locally egged Rod Thorne's house. That that's where it was going. Well, go. where the pra their practice facility was then, and where his house was wasn't too far away. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> There's a story I was rereading. Uh, re Chris's skimming. book. And Chris, Chris's I mean, book. Chris's Herring's book. Uh, I mean, his was a beauty. I mean, his late. I mean, there's those chapters in there of that. You know that heat series. You know, heat Nick's rivalry that really just sum sum but it up there. He was supposed to come on today, but he had internet issues, and so we'll we'll do it another time. But the, but I had forgotten that the the Knicks, I guess, working with the players' union, tried to go to Manhattan District Court, I think, to get a temporary restraining order blocking the suspensions of all their players in games six and seven of the ninety-seven. I think it's a second round series. It was a second round series, and the judge. Uh, judge Rakoff, I think Jed Rakoff is his name, who's be a really famous judge. He was involved in a lot of the the financial meltdown stuff in 2008, um, as, as you oversaw some of those cases. Um, I don't know if he's a Knicks fan, but his wife is a huge Knicks fan, and he got the case, and he sided with the league and said, look, the rule's the rule. Like, these guys broke the rule. The league is totally fine to suspend them. And his wife told him, don't come home. Don't come home tonight. You're banned. <laughs> it's a great story. Um, I don't know what else I was going to say. I I just I mean I I, I mean hey look at this. I worked for the Nets in the, in you know in the '90s here. The, one of my great stories that I've never told anyone this. Doran, we played the Heat in a in a regular season game, and this was when they had Keith Askins and Vashon. Like those guys were like some mean mother. Sean efforts. Leonard is like my ultimate teenaged me. I just thought Vashawn Leonard was awesome. I don't even know why. I just had really unreasonable faith and affection for Sean for Vashawn Leonard. Yeah, and and so what happened was we're playing them. I've never told this story, so I'll, I'll say it now: is that we're playing them on a, a Sunday afternoon, and we're actually having, this is when Cal Perry's the coach. We have a good team, and um, Keith Van Horn went up for a layup, and basically, if it was in this day and age, the um. um Keith Askins would have been suspended like 30 games if this was now. And I was so mad. I'm standing in the corner of the arena. I got so mad. I tried to run on a court. 
And what happened was I got my pants stuck on like there was like a like a chair and my pant leg ripped off my pants. Literally, I had like one leg. And the security guy grabbed me from behind. I tried to run on the court. So so if that had happened, you're not talking to me right now. So I'm, what is your do you think you're gonna fight Keith Askins? Like what do yes. you what is your intention? I, I have no idea what would have happened if I ran on the court. It was not gonna go well for you. It was no 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 no. I would not be in the league. I would not be covering the NBA, but that's how much disdain I had for those heat teams back in the you know, and the, those those guys were some tough, you know, with Zoe and that crew. I mean, that that was a tough Tim Hardaway Jr. I mean, like oh, those, those guys. Tough. Oh, you didn't want to mess with those. I don't want to mess with Zoe now. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 um, yeah, it would not, it would not have gone. You're lucky that the security guard rescued you from, from that fate. Um, different times, different, different times. times. That is That's right. funny. Keith Askins. Yeah. He not going to go well for you. All right. Let's talk a little bit of, um, Oh, front, front office executives. You rarely see them run on the court. That, 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 that would have been, and it reminded me, do you remember Pacers Lakers this year in LA? Yeah, Kevin Pritchard ran out after Nemhart hit the three, right? Yes. And I'm watching that game and Nebhart hits this buzzer beating three to beat the Lakers. And there, there's like a gaggle of guys, everyone's on the floor. And I'm like, is that Kevin Pritchard? <laughs> and I'm like, you never, and he's in the middle of the huddle, like jumping up and down. Like, like, where did he come from? Where was he sitting courtside? You never see a GM out there like that. And I called around a little bit the next day. I was like, is that normal? Did I, do I miss that happening? And it, and it turned out like he just got caught up in the moment and he's out there with his team. So it's just like a bunch of players celebrating and there's, you know, gray haired Kevin Pritchard getting tackled Listen, on the floor. We all, we all get caught up in the moment. The, the, the Cardinal rule though, and we'll go on, we'll talk about Boston Philly in a minute is the Cardinal rule. Billy King told me this, we, this is what happened in Toronto during the playoffs is that don't turn around. Like if you're in the stands and people are heckling you, once you turn around and make eye contact, you're done. Like you are done because then it's going to be a full barrage. That's why I give Bob Myers all that credit. And that, if you've ever seen that, that clip in that Sacramento series, when the guy's like, he has like the cowbell and it's ringing in his ear. And Bob just stood there. Didn't even do any. It just stood there and watched the game there. So it's, I mean, it's the, the your range of emotions during these games when you're in, you know, from a front office perspective, because you have no control. You have no control over what goes on. I'm glad you brought up the words because I did want to say one thing. I remember in late October of this season, Clay Thompson gave this really impassioned monologue after Charles Barkley had said something that I don't remember exactly what Charles said, but it was essentially like Clay Thompson's not the same guy anymore. It's not the same guy. And Clay talked about how hurt he was by Charles's comment that, that, you know, he's accomplished so much as a player that for the other all time, great players to sit there and nitpick him after what he's been through tearing his ACL in the finals and then rehabbing that and then tearing his Achilles in a pickup, I think a pickup game tearing his Achilles by itself, yeah. devastating. And so he comes into this season and he doesn't look great, right? He doesn't look great defensively looks like he's lost a step well like what people didn't know and what slowly came out was he didn't do a lot in the offseason he didn't play a lot in the offseason between by the way averaging 20 points a game in their championship run last year and this season he didn't do much part of the reason he didn't do much was he's kind of scarred by when he did a lot of pickup stuff he suffered a really devastating injury and so he came in not in the best shape of his career and he said in that monologue, like, man, I, I, I'm going to keep working. That's all I know how to do. And I think I'm going to have a great season. And he goes, bet on that and got off the podium. And we did NBA today the next day. And they asked me for my reaction. And I said, I absolutely loved it. I said, it baffles me that people are nitpicking what this guy looks like after these two devastating injuries. Like, of course, he doesn't look like the same player. How could he be the same player? But people just washed away because he didn't look good for two months. Washed away the fact that he came back last year and was a critical player on a team that won the NBA championship. And when he said bet on that and got up, I said, man, I am betting on Klay Thompson all day. 
It's never going to be smooth. There will be games where he's a little cold. Maybe he won't ever be the same defensive player he was again, although he's looked pretty damn good the last few months. But that shot, the roving shot, the quick release shot, that ain't going anywhere ever. And every time he has a game like he had last night, I think back to that monologue that people have probably forgotten about and how hurt he was. He was hurt. It was like visceral to see his reaction. And I think he bet on him. I bet on him. The Warriors never lost any faith on him. And I just, I think it's, I, he was sensational last night. Well, and, and, I, and, that, and I think about that. I think yeah. about that a lot. Well, and there, and there, and there's part of me, you know, certainly after they beat um, Sacramento and, we're, who at where we don't know where this series will go, how far this team goes here. And there's and there's part of me like saying like with all you know, we've talked about all these new rules that are gonna come in place and the financial restrictions. It's like there's part of me saying like, you know what? Clay, Draymond, uh, Steph, those are the guys should who should decide when this is over. Right? Like they're the ones who should like, you know, you know, I know ownership will and front office will make that decision here as far as payroll and stuff but they're for what they've been able to accomplish they're the ones who should who should decide um you know when you know when this chapter of this you know of this team is is over here let's talk real quickly about boston philly because they're playing tonight so i don't want to overdo anything on a game that's going to happen in like eight hours or whenever it's going to happen Obviously, disappointing performance by the Sixers in Joel Embiid's return game, a game two, easy win for Boston. Um, I think Boston has figured out that if they just drive to the rim and that their best players can get any matchup they want at any time, whether it's Maxi or Harden, even Tobias Harris doesn't have the speed really to keep up with Tatum and Brown. Just put your head down, drive to the rim, draw help, kick, Whatever it's going to be, you're going to get a three, another drive, whatever it is, they can get to that anytime. I'm interested to see, you know, and and, and I think that's why the, the the double big push and pull for Boston is really interesting because there's, I think Robert Williams can have a major impact in this series, and particularly when one of P.J. Tucker and Jalen McDaniels is on the floor for him not to guard. But on the flip side, there is really something to Boston stretching and beat out on defense and just saying, when we drive like that, he's on Al Horford in the corner and he can't get to the rim in time and we can kind of have our way. So I'm interested to see how they balance that out. And two other things I'm, I'm just curious about. Harden and Bede, 13 pick and rolls in game two. That's the sixth fewest in any game this season. Three of the five that are fewer than that were against the Nets in the first round where they didn't they didn't even need to do anything because the Nets just put three guys on Embiid every time they cross half court. I just the Celtics are gonna sell out to take away Embiid's easy sort of pick and pop mid-range or whatever looks. They have six or seven different defenses they use to combat that play, switching, scram switching, you know, trapping. What they'll mix in lots of stuff. They'll leave, they'll even kind of invite Harden to drive a little bit and and stick to Embiid and see if Harden can beat him that way. I wonder if they were almost too too respectful of Boston's defense they, or what happened there or just Joel's kind of, kind of feeling his way back into the series. Obviously, it was a blowout too. The other thing that's interesting to me is you can see in the substitutions, Philly doesn't like when Robert Williams is in the game particularly even when it's Robert Williams, Grant Williams, when, when it's not Robert Williams, Al Horford and the spacing is a little better. And so every time Jalen McDaniels comes in the game or PJ Tucker's in the game, other than the starting five, here comes Robert Williams and the lane gets all clogged. And Robert Williams just ignores Jalen McDaniels, Jalen McDaniels, this is a three PJ Tucker misses a three. All right, here comes George and Yang. And then Robert Williams goes out of the game because there's no non shooter for him to guard. And so I'm interested tonight how that chess match goes and whether the Sixers can survive defensively with neither of those guys on the floor and a lineup I've always liked for Philly. And I'm watching for it tonight is Maxi Melton, Harden, Harris, and Bede. So three guards, Harris and Bede, no Tucker, no McDaniels. I, I don't like it. Like that should be the starting five or that lineup should play 20 minutes a game, but I like it. I think it's played one minute in the playoffs, 
played 127 minutes in the regular season. It's not like their defense with Tucker is going to, is, is lighting the world on fire. I mean, all Boston has to do is set one screen and they get Harden on Jalen Brown and it's over. I just think that kind of group is worth a try to see how it might stress Boston's defense. But, you know, again, this is a series that had a, a landmark game won by Harden and B didn't play and B comes back. It doesn't look, you know, super. I mean, there, there's going to be an, an integration period again for him. Like, it's sneaking up on us now. This is a, these are huge games given what's at stake for these two franchises, given Harden's impending free agency, given how many times will Embiid run into the same wall in this round before he he before he just starts to wonder like is this just my fate here at forever and ever? You know, Jalen Brown is likely going to be eligible for a supermax in the offseason. What is a second round loss if that's what happens here due to their decision making there? Like there's a massive amount at stake in this series. And and really it's almost like the series now starts tonight. Like both teams know the terms of engagement. Everybody's back. Let's see it. I would, I would go to even further and say that, you know, the game three is probably one of the biggest in, that Philadelphia has had in, in recent memory, just because I'm looking at the short turnaround to game four, right? I mean, you go from a, you go from a Friday night and now you're playing three 30 on a Sunday. You know, with Embiid, you know, still, still not 100%, but, you know, 80%, maybe 75% here. And what, where is he going to be, right? Like, where, where is he going to be on Sunday as far as for, um, w- you know, w- with his body here? And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that lineup that you mentioned, you basically kind of spread the floor and you have Embiid up top. I mean, that's kind of, you have got me. I thought Melton played really well in that, you know, in game one, he's limited to 18 minutes in game two, one of five from the field. Um, you know, I understand, you know, Tucker, you know, what he can do for you defensively. Um, it's a risk. As, I mean, yeah. it's a risk and I wouldn't, I'm yeah. not saying they should lean too far that way and their defense will suffer without, without either of those, those two guys on the floor. Yeah. I mean, so that's why I say, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you, if Philly loses game three, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we get back. I don't know if we get to a game six, you know, like it um, could, it could snowball a little bit here. Well, you know? I'm not going there yet. I mean, they got yeah. two home games. You figure they should get at least one and it's going to be a war from there. But yeah, if they lose, if they lose tonight, then all the pressure is on them because they can't fall down three, one without home court advantage. I don't think in game um, two, J- in, in game two, Jalen Brown, when he's attacking the basket, um, you know, when he's, if he's not settling, I mean, that is, I mean, that's, a, I mean, Tatum was, I mean, what did Tatum have? Seven points that game? Yeah, he was one of seven, I think, or something um, like that. Um, so it's it's. I mean, I love that. That's why I love the playoffs. Is that every game is its own like little like mini series? You know, like let's see what's what does Philly do, do tonight differently that combats what they didn't do in game two. I and I've been looking forward to this matchup all year. And game one was awesome, except MB didn't play. Game two, MB did play. And it's always just fascinating to see how the Celtics guard him. They didn't double him hardly ever. They shaded. They shaded. They tried to deny him catches so that when he did catch it, he wouldn't really have time to attack the rim. And so they were not going to double him and say, shoot a fadeaway. And he made him because he's Joel Embiid. I think it's a great matchup. And uh, we shall see. Bobby Marks, you're a lifesaver. And you're what? What do we got? What do we got? Any? Oh, we're 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 in a little interregnum now for you. We're in a little bit reports. of a, you know we're we're modern as Phoenix Denver series. You know we've got ninety uh, percent of the Suns written up, so we'll see where this go. I mean, they get they get down three zero. He could not be pretty for Phoenix, and um, yeah, that's the big thing. We're just monitoring these series, and um, you know the Suns could be team twenty three potentially as far as um eliminated here and that would be another we'll do another podcast on them as far as well, what for anyone who wants my analysis and tim bontemps analysis on that series we did that a couple of days okay. ago there's been a long break between between games two and tonight bobby marks thank you sir uh i hope you saved the the missing leg of those pants and you have it somewhere as a, <laughs> as a, as a, as a, that was skinny bobby marks <laughs> thank you sir thank you All right, we have to end today with a coaching change. And this is the season of coaching change. And once I get in the playoff bunker, uh, not many of them rise to the level that I can really address them 
in detail. You know, we we talked a little bit about Ime Odoka to Houston and Nick Nurse being uh, parting ways with the Raptors. But some coaching changes, you need to pause and take a breath and figure out what happened and figure out what's going to happen. And when the team with the best player in the world who's up for a contract extension in September, who has a potential outgoing free agent in Chris Middleton, another outgoing free agent in Brooke Lopez, their second best player who kind of went haywire on offense again in the playoffs, Drew Holiday, um, who brings it on defense all the time and had to guard Jimmy Butler. So I, I forgive it a little bit, a, a, a lot bit. Uh, he's up for an extension in the middle of the next season. And that team fired Mike Budenholzer after a five-year tenure that included the Milwaukee Bucks' first NBA title in 50 years. That's a big deal. It's a big deal for all the reasons I just outlined. It's a big deal because this is Giannis's team. It's a big deal because they just said goodbye to the coach who got them to where they wanted to go and where they had not been in 50, 5-0 years, and now they have to hire a new coach. And yet... I said it after a collapse from which I'm still reeling that I, I did just didn't see how they could come back intact as a team, whether that was the coach, whether that was something else after what had happened against the heat. And so here we are. And to help us sort this all out from the athletic who chronicles this team better than anybody that I know, Eric name, aggressive question asker, failure chronicler, Eric name. How are you, sir? I am well, Zach. Yeah. First of all, we should we should acknowledge right up front that Bud suffered a family tragedy during the first round of the playoffs. Is one of his brothers passed away in a car accident. And setting aside all of this, I've known Bud not not super well, but we've gotten coffees and dinners and chatted at games. I've seen him at social events for I don't know ten years now, and you know. Um, I I've always enjoyed his company. And as a human being, you just hate to see anybody going through all of these things at the same time. Um, a personal tragedy, um, something pretty close to probably the low point in any coach's career, the level of criticism he received. And I think, unfortunately, the criticism was justified. I just, I just don't think you can, the timeout not called at the end of regulation is, is you just, there's, you just can't do it. It just can't happen. The timeout not called uh, at, at the end of overtime when they didn't get a shot off. I don't care really about that. That's a typical coach. A lot of coaches just say, let them play, go up, like, and all that, and the, the adjustments, which we'll talk about. But on a human level, you know, I everyone is feeling for Bud, and this is a very tough moment. And and you know John Horst, the GM of the Bucks, or I don't know if he's the president of basketball operations, and I can't keep track of people's titles. Um, he and Bud are very close. Like this is a decision that I think was probably heart wrenching, e even even if the personal tragedy had not happened um, for John Horst. And obviously, it's not his his decision alone. Only there's a, an ownership group, including a new incoming ownership group. But just step back for a minute. Now that this news has happened, kind of what have you heard about just? the tenor of the organization, the emotion, the emotional sort of temperature of the organization right now? I mean, I just think there's a lot of shock. And uh, obviously some of that's on a very personal level with like a personal tragedy for Mike Budenholzer. And just, uh, I truly, I truly can't imagine. Um, I can't imagine trying to write about playoff basketball um, with the, sudden passing of my brother i couldn't i truly couldn't imagine trying to prepare for nba basketball um with that going on so uh, i think it it kind of starts there but then just as an organization when you're looking at this team i, I don't think anyone could have ever foreseen this happening this season like uh, to have the best record to see the heat struggle in the way that they struggled in that play in tournament. And then to play the way that they did. I just, I don't think anyone could see that coming. And, you, you know, I've, I've seen some people say like, Oh, you know, in 21, you know, there was the thought if the bucks lost in, in the 
in the playoffs, then, you know, then Bud might be gone. And we didn't hear any of that beforehand. Well, of course we didn't hear any of that beforehand. They were the, they're the number one seed. They're the best team in the league. Like you, you don't act, like, no one's talking about like, Oh yeah, we might fire a coach when we're the best team in the NBA. And, and I think that speaks to just kind of the shock uh, around the organization. This is just something that, that no one expected. And I, the contract situation speaks to that, right? Like Bud had two years, $16 million left on his deal. Um, this was a situation where I think the whole organization was thinking, all right, we feel like we should have won the championship last year, gone back to back, but Chris Middleton gets hurt, but that's okay. We're going to win two in three years. And, and that'll be like, that'll be fine. That'll show that we were justified in what we did last year. That'll show that we know what we're doing as an organization. And, and then to have, as Giannis put it in his postgame presser, the worst postseason he's ever been a part of, which is factually true uh, because it's the fewest games they've ever won in a postseason that he's participated. The The number on the marker board at the end of the season was 15, uh, 15 wins away from a championship. I, I just can't, I don't think anyone in the orga organization really had any sense that this was coming and, as you mentioned, this was going into what was already a difficult offseason. This was not going to be an easy offseason, period, right? Like figuring out what Chris Middleton's going to do. Is he going to opt into his $40 million player option? Is he going to opt out and then sign an extension? Is he going to opt in and then try to play for another? Like, what's he going to do? Who knows? That was going to be a big question because the repeater tax is here. And the Milwaukee Bucks are, are going to have to deal with that if Chris Middleton uh, sticks around. And on top of that, Brooke Lopez just put together. Um, I didn't have a vote this year, but I I know a guy that's on a, a whole bunch of all defensive teams uh, at center. This is I'm guessing an all he's going to get an all defensive nod. Um, and obviously, he finished in, in the top for defensive player of the year as well. So like he's he's there. Uh, he needs a contract. And, and how are you going to do that? Going into his 16th season, uh, going into his 35, his age 35 season, like all of those things were going to be really difficult, right? But the assumption was, hey, you know, if we win a championship, all right, you know, maybe it's okay to pay the, the repeater tax and, you know, the bill will be totally fine. That's okay. When you lose in the first round, the calculus is uh, anything you thought you knew it's it's thrown out the window whatever you thought you had or what was planned it has to go in a different direction and, and i think obviously what you've seen is is the very first move that you could potentially make is is firing a coach who uh, i think just had a, a really bad postseason like if you look at that series there's just a lot of stuff where you know i ended up questioning a lot of stuff from from the very start of that series even before Giannis got hurt the first thing I was looking for Zach was who has Jimmy Butler and it was Drew Holiday on the very first possession and you know this well I know this well in 2020 in the bubble I asked Giannis did you ever ask to cover Jimmy Butler and he looked at me and said why would you ask that because I was supposed to know that in their system, he doesn't do that. He's not going to be the one-on-one -on -one defender. He's a help defender. That's how these things go. Lo and behold, in 2021, when they swept the Miami Heat in the first round, who was Giannis on? Jimmy Butler. And they just suffocated the Heat in that series with, with Giannis on Jimmy Butler, with Brooke on Bam Adebayo. Now, it's if I recall, Giannis went under picks on Jimmy a lot in that series. He did? And I think one of the reasons we didn't see that in this series is a, I don't think Bud thinks it's a great matchup. Like I, I think Bud doesn't, I don't think that coaching staff thinks Giannis is that great compared to how he is as a help defender defending not quicker players, but guys who are just shorter than him. Like, like almost everybody who handles the ball, they can just move around a little bit more with a little more nimbleness and agility. And I think Jimmy would have been totally okay with that matchup. But I think one of the things Jimmy did is he made enough jumpers that he scared the Bucks and he has scared the Knicks 
out of yeah. going under picks against him. And I think if you take that tool away from Giannis, just to defend Bud a little bit, because I don't think that's the silver bullet that it's been made out to be. I think if you take that tool away, now I think I'm playing the math on Jimmy more than these coaches are. Like I would, I would dare a little bit, especially with the guy who has a seven, whatever wingspan going under picks. But if you take that weapon away, that's a tougher job um, for Giannis. And I think people, people, understand it to be absolutely and I, I will say also during the 2021 championship run uh you know as the bucks were getting ready to play the nets i told Giannis that i think one of his weaknesses is getting over screens and he said yeah it is but i'm also the best seven footer in the world at doing it what and a what a life by the way eric name just walks up to Giannis. hey man i got something to say to you you got a weak spot i want to talk to you about Getting overpicked. And Giannis respects you so much. He's like, yeah, you know what? You're probably right, but but I'm the best seven footer in the world at it. And it's really tough to to dis to disagree with. So, like whether or not you agree that Giannis should cover Jimmy or not cover Jimmy, the fact that I could ask that question at the start of the series and I didn't have a good answer for what it would look like at the end of the series speaks to the and it's the thing that always comes up with bud you know the lack of adjustments or you know trying to stay within the game plan and making small tweaks to the game plan rather than you know throwing out the whole game plan and like, that's not to say the bucks didn't do different stuff against against the heat they did like they they tried different people they had di pe different people do different things but overwhelmingly drew holiday was on jimmy butler and it didn't work and and the bucks just never found a way out of that so you start with that and then in games four and games five, the fourth quarter offense just falls apart. Just well, ab that, absolutely that's... falls apart. And overwhelmingly, and, and this is the thing I tell people all the time, because the, the biggest critique of Mike Boonholzer over the last five years is the drop defense, you give up too many threes, and the defense just isn't good enough, blah, blah, blah. When is Brooke Lopez going to stop playing? All that stuff. That's always the critique. And the thing I always try to tell people is the reason why they've been losing these series anytime they've gotten upset is the offense isn't good enough. The half court offense. That's so, it. That they just can't find their way out of the mud. And, and that happened again in the fourth quarter of game four. And in the fourth quarter of game five, they blow a 14 point lead and a 16 point lead because they just can't score. And that's, if you're talking about like, how does it build up to the point where eventually you're going to fire Mike Budenholzer, who's has the greatest win percentage in Milwaukee Bucks coaching history, uh, has more playoff wins across the last five seasons than any other coach in the NBA, like all those things. How do you build up to that point? I think the fact that that was a problem that was not fixed again, five years in, that's what you're looking at to me that's where like if you're trying to figure out how this happens sure the adjustments and stuff like that that people want to talk about is fine but they just never found their way to finding consistent regular half court offense in the games when it and it when it really mattered and maybe that speaks to their talent maybe that speaks to their personnel um but overwhelmingly that's the question that's gone unanswered and it's gone well, unanswered for five years even when they won the title in 2021 if you look at the numbers series by series so so you mentioned the rumblings that bud would have gotten fired had they lost that net series in the second round those rum rumblings were real and they were out there and everybody heard them yep and you mentioned how there weren't those rumblings this season the difference is they won the title in 2021. And let's just stop there for a second. We could sit here and talk about all the stuff that we disagreed with, with, with Bud. They won the championship. You could never take it away from him ever. And let's credit him further. He walked in the door and he tore down all the stuff that Jason Kidd was doing wrong. And Jason Kidd wasn't doing everything wrong. Ask Giannis. You ask Giannis all the hard questions, ask him about that. He'll tell you that he likes some things Jason Kidd did. But he tore down the aggressive trapping defense, built a whole new defense that we're taking the rim, we're not fouling, we're going to give up some threes, and we'll live with that. 
Then this year he adjusted the defense. Like, all right, let's try to try to take away the threes. Now we've aired too much in that direction in the championship year. They bring in PJ Tucker. He starts to switch a little bit more to have that baked in for when they need a little bit more versatility, shoot more threes, play with more pace. Like we we're going to talk about the problems that we have, but give, give bud the credit he deserves. He came in and wiped away a philosophy and a system and a structure that wasn't working and replaced it with a foundation that did work half court offense failed and it was failing in that net series until you know some injuries happened they turned it around a little bit but even in the sun series and the hawk series it was just okay it was like okay enough for their defense and their offensive rebounding and their transition offense freak show gyro stepping four steps down the whole court to to win them the title and you can never take that away but um well th- so to me that's where this gets really interesting right like so i just talked for i don't know however many minutes five minutes about the problems right in the things that went wrong um mike boonholz is a really good nba coach uh, undeniably like there's He's a three-time coach of the year there there's no there's no argument against it from day one he came in and they were successful and not just on one side of the ball on both sides of the ball and yes, this is where the naysayers will say, well, he has Giannis Dedekumbo. Of course, he can create a great offense and a great defense. Sure. Like that that's it, that's a fair response. But there's a lot of teams that are really talented around the league and don't. They just don't. They, they have lots of talent in offense and it doesn't work. They have lots of talent in defense and it doesn't work. From day one, they came in. And at no point in the regular season did the Bucs finish below 15th in either offense or defense in five years under Mike Budenholzer. And they were top 10 in four of the five seasons. And the defense was first, first, and for his first two years and fourth in his fifth year. Like, overwhelmingly, Mike Budenholzer is a really good coach. And I think that's where all of this becomes even more fascinating because if that's the base, there, there's nothing, uh, again, you, you're you going to have to tear it down and, and make your own ways. Every coach is going to have to do that. You're going to have to make your own schemes and do all of that. But the floor is really high. Like, it's, it's really, really high. And even if you want to say that they should have won more championships, appeared in more finals, they still won one. So the standard for the new coach coming in, whoever it is, is be one of the best teams in the league and win a championship in your first three seasons. And I and I hate the line of thought that I see all the time is, well, if they had a different coach, they'd have two or three titles by now. Really? You know that you know that for sure? You you want to go through the, the teams with superstar players who have won zero? You want to talk yeah. about the Clippers? You want to talk about, you know, we we Talk about the Nets. Talk about the Suns being down 2-0 right now to the Denver Nuggets as we record this. The Sixers haven't gotten to the conference finals with Joel Embiid. Celtics still haven't broken through. You want to talk to me about all the teams? Like, it's easy to win one, let alone, like, oh, yeah, if you just replaced them with Eric Spolstra, they'd be four-time champions. No one's going to get hurt at the wrong time in one of those particular years. Now, let's go just just, just to go, and, and I think, but but those fourth quarters against Miami were a complete team wide meltdown. Everybody is culpable. Everybody yeah. they looked they looked frankly shaken and and overwhelmed. I, I actually don't think I think the Bucks were a little overconfident coming into the series. I don't think they expected the Heat to come out and punch them in the mouth. I don't know if they slow played Giannis coming back from that injury. That was a real injury, and he was in rough shape after the game. He did come back. But I think they just kind of didn't expect this kind of ferocity from Miami, even though they have seen it up close multiple times in the playoffs. And they didn't have an answer for it. They did not have – when the games got tough, when Miami roared and punched them in the face, they looked shaken, and they rolled over, and they looked like a team in the half court that didn't know what it wanted to do, that didn't have a foundational tentpole thing that said, when all else fails, when it's loud and we can't hear each other, we can't hear whatever Bud is saying, 
when it's stressful, when Jimmy is snarling in our face and talking all sorts of junk, when Bam is up there guarding four people at once, we can do this. And this used to be Middleton, Giannis, pick and roll. And they lost that in this series and in this season to some degree, maybe because of Middleton's sort of up and down health and up and down play. Who knows for what other reason? They just didn't have a tent pole to go to. And as you said, the half court offense falling apart is the defining feature of if you, if you want to go, by the way, if you want to go through the, all the times they allegedly should have won the title, let's do it. 2019 buds first year, they go from 40, whatever wins to 60, whatever wins up to O in the conference finals against the Raptors lose four straight games. I honestly, I was at a lot of that series in both cities that felt to me like just two awesome teams and one team just kind of figured out the other one and beat them. Like that didn't feel, I know losing four straight, the optics of that are bad. That didn't feel to me like, oh, the Bucks choked. That felt to me like the Raptors took that series from them. 2020, it's the bubble. It just didn't work out. Uh, whatever whatever you want to say, like it was just bad. Maybe they, did, they, they didn't want to be, who knows? I don't know. I, the bubble was the bubble. 2021, they won the title. 2022, Middleton gets hurt. 2023, here we are. Um, it's not, it, it, where's the missing championship? I don't know which year it is, but there is a missing half court offense and spinning it forward. Now the question becomes, who are they going to hire? And that is linked inextricably to who's going to be on the team next year. My assumption is the only prior, the, the overarching priority of all this is like, we have to keep Giannis happy. And the only way to keep you honest happy is we got to win. And I don't really see any functional way for them to keep winning by letting these players go, or I don't know what sign and trades are possible. It's going to be very hard for them to really revamp the roster the way that it is. And so if I'm looking at a coach, you talked about Bud raising the floor. I've kind of jokingly called Bud coach low hanging fruit, which I think he might take as an insult. I mean, it as a compliment. There are lots of coaches who don't pluck the low hanging fruit. He takes it all, gobbles it up, turns it into a smoothie and the bucks win 60 games. I think they need that tactician that can be two steps ahead in the playoffs on the adjustments that, that can, can be really creative thinking in building a, a more sort of coherent half court offense. I don't know who that is. I don't know if it's going to be Charles Lee, who's on the bench now, but is a finalist for the Pistons job. Nick Nurse is a, like a tactician tactician, but the Raptors offense was clunky and hard to watch. Like there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of names here. This is going to be a big, big job, but that if I'm, if I'm making the hire step one is I want to hear your offensive game plan, forget transition. We know what we can do in transition, but how do you think they're going to approach it? I think where it gets really difficult is what you mentioned with Giannis looming, right? Like everything you do is about keeping that guy happy. And, and I know Bucks fans don't want to hear it. He signed a super max extension. Like he's going to stay here for life. Nobody and, ever changes teams in the NBA. I mean, it's ridiculous to even like broach the, hey, like I, sniff around the topic. I needed to put the qualifier in there, Zach. Uh, I needed to put it in there. So I, I understand that. Right. But you have to keep him happy. And, and I think where all of this gets difficult is I'm typically of the belief that if I'm looking for a coach, I want something new, I want something fresh, I want something innovative. And that typically means someone that has not done the job before. And when you look at what the Bucks just had, they had a championship winning coach, that won 50 games pretty much every season. Man, that's a big ass from someone that's never done the job. It's It just is. And when you think through that, I think you have to think about like, okay, like how do you convince Giannis that this is a good idea and not grabbing one of the names that he knows that has won a championship that, yeah, maybe they're not quite as exciting, but they've done the job. And I think that's where it gets really tough. Like, it, it to me, this is a really tough job market out there because 
everyone's going to want this job. Why wouldn't you, right? You get to coach the best player in the world. That's awesome. Uh, no, but, and by the way, uh, no frills, no hassle. All I want to do is show up and work hard and play and do everything as hard as I can, player. That sounds great. But at the same time, you have to win immediately. And, and I think you do have to have some sort of command of the room when you walk in there. Because if you're flailing and trying new things, uh, this is a vet. This is a veteran team, and they've been used to winning. And you know, like as this season went through, you, you'll remember in December it was like, oh, you know, what's going on in the Bucks locker room? They weren't winning, and they're pissed off about it. They like to win. That that's what this veteran-led team likes to do. And again, we've seen first-year coaches get through it, right? Ime Udoka had a really, I'm not going to say disastrous couple of months, first couple of months, but like it was rocky. Under fi- under 500. It was rocky to start and then he figured it out and it was great. So that's not to say a new coach that doesn't have head coaching experience in the NBA can't do it. I- I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying when you're trying to convince the whole organization that this is what you've moved on from Mike Budenholzer for, I think it gets a little bit tougher. And that's why this job opening is just going to be fascinating to watch. You mentioned um, command of the room. What do you think the state of the relationship between Bud and and the players was? Like, just, I I don't want to say vibes. I've grown to hate that word. But just, you know, there comes a time when it's just time, right? Like, when, when just... I, it's not that the voice is tuned out or they're sick of him or the person has lost the locker room. And I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm asking you the question. There comes a time when it's just, everyone's just been around each other for too long of a time. You've experienced too much sort of negativity in terms of losing together. What what was the state of that? I mean, I just think, and you know, I, I remember questioning Brooke Lopez about this at, at the start of last season. I, the Bucks mantra is get better every day. And if you talk to anyone in the organization, it doesn't matter if it's John Horst, Mike Boonholzer, Giannis Dedekumbo, Lindell Wigginton, but no, no matter where you are on the roster, hey, all we're trying to do is get better every day. As a journalist, it's really annoying because that doesn't help me write anything interesting. <laughs> that, 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 that's just a boring answer. Yes, I know you're trying to get better every day, but like, can we talk about something going wrong or how you're going to try to do that? And to me, I asked Brooke at the start of last year, like, why does this actually work? Like, if most teams say that, I've been around plenty of teams. And if you drop that type of, let's call it a cliche, it's just bull- Okay, cool. You try to get better every day. Like, it doesn't mean anything. But in Milwaukee, like, it actually worked. And I just think when you win a championship in 2021 and then you have what happened last year with Middleton getting hurt, like, I think you could still preach the same message and have the same beliefs and go into this season doing it. But now that it didn't work one more time, I I just think it would be really hard for them to run it back and just be like, yep, this is the mantra that's always worked for us when again, it did work first championship in 50 seasons that's something that will be Mike Gunholzer's legacy in Milwaukee forever. I just think after dropping this series in the first round, albeit there are extenuating circumstances, I just think it'd have been really hard to come back and try to do that again. It could be a really interesting off season in Milwaukee. Uh, Eric name, read all the stuff at the athletic um, absolute first rate job. Thanks for making a little time on the low post and, Maybe I'll see it summer league. I don't know, uh, but uh, I would uh, let's uh, let's say hello soon, my friend. Sounds good. Can't wait.